A uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Welcome, Dr. Manisha and Dr. Merlin. Who is Dr. Manisha? You are Manisha. Fine. Uh, fine. So the case uh, is about preeclampsia. You can start presenting, and we will go with the flow. Right. Case presentation is preeclampsia for emergency LSEs. First, the patient details. The patient is Mahima. You'll have to be a little louder. Uh, we are not able to hear you. Bring, get close to the mic, please. Okay. Patient is Mahima, 23-year-old lady. She's pursuing degree in economics. She's wife of Riju, an accountant. She's a resident of Kottam district. She is a primary gravita. At 35 weeks of gestation, admitted with complaints of high BP recording. Presenting complaints, blurring of vision two days, high BP recording two days. History of present illness, pregnancy confirmed by urine pregnancy test after one week of misperate. Patient was apparently normal two days back when she developed blurring of vision. She was taken to a local hospital where she was detected with high BP recording of 186 by 108 millimeters of mercury. She was started on IV antihypertensives and was referred to medical college hospitals to Antrim. She had bilateral lower limb edema since 28 weeks of gestation. She gives no history of nausea, vomiting, headache, seizures, no history of chest pain, single palpitations, no history of dyspnea, orthopnea, no history of jaundice, epigastric pain, shoulder pain or easy bruisability, no history of decreased urine output, no history of facial puffness, periorbital edema. Family history, no history of diabetes, hypertension, cardiac illness in the family. Personal history, she had mixed diet, sleep and appetite normal, bowel and bladder habits normal. Menstrual history, she attained manak at the age of 14 years, had regular cycles of 28 days, no history of menorrhagia, dysmenorrhea. Marital history, she married 10 months back, non-consanguineous marriage. Treatment history, she is now on oral antihypertensive medication. Obstructive history, she is a primary gravida, last menstrual period on 16-6-2022, expected date of confinement 25-3-2023, gestation age 35 weeks. First trimester, she had regular antenatal checkups. First trimester scan was normal. First dose of TT was taken. Folic acid was taken. No history of bleeding, PV, urinary tract infection, fever with rashes, exposure to radiation or drugs. Second trimester, she had regular antenatal checkups. Calcium and iron tablets were taken. Second dose of TT taken. Quickening felt at fifth month of gestation. Her anomaly scan was normal and no history of GDM or gestational hypertension. Third trimester, iron and calcium tablets were taken. She had a high BP recording at 35 weeks of gestation associated with blurring of vision. Her third trimester ultrasound scan was normal. General examination, her pre-pregnant weight was 36 kg, her present weight 47 kg, height 154 cm, BMI of 20 kg per meter square. She was moderately built and nourished. No pallor, icterus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy. She had bilateral pitting pedal edema, gait and spine normal, breast and thyroid normal. Vital signs, pulse 86 per minute, regular, normal volume and character, condition of vessel wall normal, no radiofemoral delay, all peripheral pulsations were bilaterally equal. Her blood pressure 110 bar 70 millimeter mercury in right upper limb in sitting position, her respiratory rate 16 per minute regular abdominal thoracic, Saturation 100 percentage of room air, and she was FF right. So, Monisha, just to interrupt you, this blood pressure reading is recent after she has been admitted with a. After just go she back to that slide. On she have, just go was back, just go back to that slide. Previous slide. Yeah, previous slide. So, now her blood pressure is 110 by 70. Uh -huh. After how many days of medication? Two days, sir. Two days. Two days. And uh, she was on oral medication now, or Initially, still on, or still on IV antihypertensives. Initially, she was on IV uh, antihypertensives. Now on oral antihypertensives. So if she's been admitted for two days, it means uh, only for one day, or maybe initially antihypertensives were given intravenously, now on oral. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Yes. 
So that 187 by 104 you said, right? Oh, yes, sir. That was a reading two days back. Two days back. Okay, fine. Airway exam is a no no deviated nasal septum external appearance normal both nostrils patent mouth opening was adequate more than 3 cm melambatic classification score 3 thyromental distance 7 cm sternomental distance 13 cm neck movements were normal temporomandibular joint can insulin at one finger no spinal tenderness examination of the cardiovascular system precardium normal apex bit felt at fourth left intercostal space in mid clavicular line no thrill first and he second heart sounds normal in all areas no murmurs examination of the respiratory system upper airway examination normal trachea central chest movements and expansion bilaterally equal air and to equal on both sides normal vesicular breath sounds no added sounds examination of cns higher functions and cranial nerves Normal sensory and motor system examination with the normal limits, no cerebellar dysfunctional major irritation, no hyperreflexia, skull and spine normal. Obstructive examination, fundal head corresponds to 36 weeks, longitudinal line, cephalic presentation, fetal heart rate of 136 per minute. Summary, 23 year old primary gravida at 35 weeks of gestation, hypertension detected at 35 weeks of gestation associated with blurring of vision had bilateral pitching fetal edema, now BP well controlled with oral antihypertensives. Diagnosis, she is a primary gravida, 35 weeks of gestation, diagnosed with hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, probably severe preeclampsia. Come in, come and have a seat. So just to begin with the discussion, how do you define preeclampsia? Preeclampsia is defined as uh, um, high blood pressure recording after 20 weeks of gestation, that is uh, systolic BP more than 140 millimeters of mercury or diastolic BP more than or equal to 90 millimeters mercury in the presence of proteinuria. That is, uh, uh, in, pre uh, uh, in pregnancy, significant proteinuria is defined as uh, protein. So, so just, just a minute. Uh, according to the recent definition, I think proteinuria has been taken off. It is no more within the definition of preeclampsia. Right. Proteinuria has been taken off. It's not in the primary definition of preeclampsia. So we say if it is gestational diabetes accompanied by one or more dysfunctions, then it is classified as preeclampsia. Proteinuria can be one of them, not the only qualifying criteria. Okay. Okay. Sir. Right. So uh, the other question would be. Now, how do you differentiate between gestational hypertension and preeclampsia and chronic hypertension, these three? Gestational hypertension develops gestational hypertension develops after 20 weeks of gestation with no proteinuria or no uh, uh, signs of preeclampsia. In preeclampsia, uh, there will be uh, there can be gestational hypertension with proteinuria. In chronic hypertension again. Mm -hmm not only proteinuria any of the any organ of the dysfunctions symptoms. like it can be cns the patient may have blurring of headache, vision blurring of vision seizures. diplopia seizures it can be either acute kidney injury or liver right? dysfunction there may be right quadrant pain right. because of liver dysfunction they can be hematological issues Right. Thrombocytopenia. Yeah, thrombocytopenia. So if any one of them are present, yes, right, yeah. then it is preeclampsia. Pre yeah. Got it? Right, so right. it's not only proteinuria. Please bring it into one of the criteria plus hypertension, which you have already classified. Yes, sir. Then chronic hypertension, hypertension developed before uh, hypertension developed before 20 weeks of gestation, or that persists after six weeks postpartum. So the other issue would be. Are you happy with this blood pressure? You said how much it is now? 118 by? Now 11070. 11070. Are you happy with this blood pressure? Okay. Within two days from 185, if the blood pressure drops down to 110, such a fall, is it acceptable? No, sir. Not right. Perfusion will be affected. Yes. So it is going to be, it's a drastic fall. 
normally they say you keep it around what the blood pressure was initially when she was detected. She's on a continuous follow-up, correct? So rather than having a blood pressure of more than 140 by 90, if it is just brought down to even 130, 80, it is acceptable, but the rate of fall of blood pressure should not be more than 25%. It should be gradually reduced. So that's one thing which got me worried, correct? So we know the definition of preeclampsia, the one, the modified one which I have told you. We know the differences between the types of hypertension which we have. And we also know that we should not correct hypertension to that level, okay, to, to make sure that the perfusion pressures do not fall drastically. So when do we call it severe preeclampsia? Either when there is severe hypertension with severe proteinuria or my hypertension. Please bring the mic to your mouth closer. People will not be able to hear you. One is when there is severe hypertension with severe proteinuria or mild so what hypertension. Is, what is severe hypertension? What? Severe hypertension is systolic BP of more than or equal to 160 millimeters of mercury, diastolic BP of more than or equal to 110 millimeters of mercury. Then severe proteinuria is more than 5 gram pro excretion of proteins in 24 hours. Or a second option. Mild hypertension with severe proteinuria. That is uh, systolic BP more than 140 or diastolic BP more than 90 millimeters of mercury. But the urine excretion, 24 hour protein excretion is more than 5 gram. Or preeclampsia with severe features. That is uh, when uh, BP is more than 140 or uh, systolic BP more than 140 or diastolic BP more than 90. Uh, in okay, the presence just, of just to correct you again, the previous definitions of categorization of preeclampsia into mild, moderate, severe is out. Okay, it is preeclampsia. Either it is preeclampsia or preeclampsia with severe form. These are the only two conditions now. So what you are saying about blood pressure is correct. Proteinuria to an extent is correct. Then you come to the come to different organs, right? So if there is an acute kidney injury, and if the ratio between the proteins, urine protein and urine Pre creatinine is more than 0 0.3, 0 0.3, either this, platelets less than one lakh, correct? Right quadrant pain with, uh, uh, with the transaminase is more than 14 Seven. international units per liter. So these are the ones which would categorize them into, into severe form, okay? And then, of course, you look at the fetus also, look at the umbilical artery, they do a Doppler study. If there is reversal of end diastolic flow or the end diastolic flow is arrested, again, that will be accounting for severe degree of preeclampsia, right? And uh, yes, the CNS, if you have if patient has diplopia and other features of headache and all, correct? So what is the, in brief, what is the pathophysiology? I know our obstetricians should know it, but when you talk about organ involvement and treatment, if you don't understand the pathophysiology, you will never go right in how to treat the patient. So just in brief, what is the pathophysiology of preeclampsia? Many theories are postulated. The most accepted one is abnormal topoplastic invasion. In no yes, correct, correct. In normal pregnancies, the uterine spinal, uh, spiral arteries are infiltrated by invasive topoplast, whereas in preeclampsia, pre this topoplastic invasion doesn't take place. As a result, the blood flow through the it uterine... It takes place, but it doesn't completely... involves a myometrium. Yes, yes, absolutely. And hence, the blood supply is reduced and there occurs placental hypoxia. Yes, we, call, we don't call it placental hypoxia. We call it as it's a stressed placenta. So that when the placental ischemia occurs because of vasoconstriction as well as the, because there is increased resistance to the blood flow from the uterus towards the placenta. So there will be placental ischemia which will happen and that will lead to release of many pro inflammatory soluble me FMS mediators. like tyrosine yes. kinase yes. 1 which will bind to vascular endothelial growth factor Correct. and placental growth factor decreasing their unbound form and uh, this will so lead to... So to be in brief that normally there should be a reduction in the resistance to, uh, to the blood flow towards the placenta. Here it doesn't occur. So there is deficiency or dysfunction of the utero placental blood flow, right? 
So the placenta doesn't get that much volume of blood, which it should normally should get. And then because of placental ischemia, there is release of tissue factors from the placenta or inflammatory factors, which leads to an overall systemic vasoconstriction. So everywhere there will be vasoconstriction, right? And that is the mainstay why problems occur in majority of the organs, correct? So what will happen into the into the CNS? What will happen to the CNS? Uh, in the central nervous system, um, uh, two thing, two, two main pathophysiology is being said. Uh, one is because of the uh, increased blood pressure, there is hyperperfusion. Hyperperfusion and abnormal uh, increased blood flow can result in vasogenic edema. So other uh, uh, other. So what will be the investigation which you would probably do bedside to know if there is some sort of cerebral edema or, or there is an issue in the CNS. What Pundal can you do? Pundal examination. Huh? Pundus, yes, if you want to look at papilledema, at least all mothers with severe preeclampsia must have that. Or you can also do the optic sheet, uh, optic nerve sheet diameter, ONST blood site, right? That also is quite sensitive. For females, it is, the, I think it is 4.8, and if it is more than Five. that, they say that there is evidence of uh, edema occurring. So that's one thing which you can do sub bedside, correct? What else? What about kidneys? What about liver? What will you investigate and how would you come to a conclusion? Liver? In, in liver, hepatic blood flow is reduced. There, uh, there occurs uh, periportal necrosis. Focal areas of necrosis occurs. The liver enzymes will be elevated more than two times of the upper limit. More than two times the upper limit. The upper that limit. is important. Yes. Correct? Yes. And kidneys? Kidneys, there will be endotheliosis, urine, urine creatinine, and uh, blood urea will be elevated. There can be oliguria. So, what is the values for creatinine? How do you say? Normally, it will be less than 9 gram per deciliter in pregnancy and creatine less than 0.6 uh, gram per deciliter in pregnancy. And more than this is abnormal in pregnancy. So if the upper limit crosses 1.1, it is abnormal. Abnormal. Okay. Or it doubles. It is twice the original value. Then it is, of course, again, it is abnormal. So that's what you need to catch at the, uh, to look at the kidneys. What about lungs? Anything else can go wrong there? In the respiratory system, uh, changes can occur in the upper airway as well as the lower airway. Yes. In upper airway, uh, the changes associated with the normal pregnancy is aggravated in preeclampsia because of the hormonal changes and because of the increased uh, vasodilatation, there is increased uh, mucosal uh, friability, uh, edema of the upper, uh, the nasopharynx, uh, the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx, edema of the vocal cord, uh, the, uh, the tongue becomes stiff uh, and less mobile. Then, um, uh, the, uh, then coming to the lower airway, uh, there is increased oxygen consumption. Uh, there is a reduction in FRC because of the upward uh, cephalid movement of the diaphragm, and increased uh, when uh, alveolar increased uh, when minute ventilation. Uh, and all these changes, uh, uh, all these changes can uh, predispose these patients for the risk of hypoxemia. So, During Merlin, what uh, whatever you have mentioned, most of them are common and. A full term pregnancy, right? Yes. So when the when there is severe preeclampsia, you need to rule out one thing. That is, if there is any evidence of interstitial edema or pulmonary edema okay. setting in, yes. right? So you look at your saturation, the patient saturation. If it is dropping down, it is 96, 95. You need to just do a probably a lung ultrasound to see if there are B lines. That can be done bedside. That's an easy marker to yes. see if there are any B lines in the bases or anywhere in the lungs. And then, of course, B lines would occur because there is a problem in the heart. Yes. Because there's too much of heart load and heart is not able to pump that volume out. Yes. So that volume is going back to the lungs. Yes. So what will you do? Uh, do an echo. Uh, yes. Right? So you can do an echo and see how far is the, what is the ejection Contact fraction and how do you need to do? And the treatment would be uh, decrease uh, the afterload. Vasoconstriction is a systemic phenomena in preeclampsia. You need to decrease the afterload. And the mainstay of treatment would be? Diuretics and nitroglycerin. Huh? 
we should give 100% oxygen along with that uh, IV medications like uh, nitroglycerin to decrease nitroglycerin infusion decreased afterload and diuretics. Okay. High dose. So to... nitroglycerin and nitroside. Initially we were using it, but now we are not using them. The reason is that one thing to the fetus it may compromise. Fetal, sir. Uh, especially the cyanide toxicity can occur even with short duration of use of nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin, what will happen in the CNS is the major issue because once there is vasodilatation, the cerebral blood flow will increase. We don't want that to happen. Remember, 30% of the preeclamptics do have a hemorrhagic stroke. Mm -hmm. So somewhere all those things have to be avoided. So nitroglycerin and nitroproside are generally avoided. What is the first drug of choice? Labetalol. Magnesium sulfate, Magnesium sulfate, if it is a very severe preeclampsia, right? Correct? Yes, okay. Because that's a, how does it act? It has got central as well as peripheral action. Centrally, it acts by inhibiting the NMDA receptors, uh, thereby remo uh, releasing the vasus spasm and so improving the cerebral blood flow. Cerebral vasodilator, yeah. that is what is the mainstay of action of magnesium sulfate. So basically, it gives you vasodilatation properties. Yes, Correct. Sir. Okay. Next is labetalol. Yes. Sir. Right. How much dose do you give, and how would you give it? Would you give it IV? And if you have to give it IV, how much dose is initially given, and then how much time do you wait for? In the case of uh, hypertensive uh, uh, crisis, we administer labetalol as twenty mg bolus dose over to uh, over two minutes. We we'll wait for twenty uh, over two minutes. Uh, then followed by 40 to 80 mg, uh, up to a maximum dose of 300 mg. What's the ratio of alpha-beta activity with, lab with labetalol? IV oh, oh. dose, IV dose, beta is to alpha action, 7 is to 1, with oral dose, 3 is to 1. Why not give only a beta blocker? What's the issue with beta blockers? Why do we need a combination of alpha and beta blocker? Uh, I say you give metoprolol. You give esmolol. Would you agree to that? No, the basic pathology in uh, uh, preeclampsia is uh, intense vasoconstriction leading to high BP. So uh, that's why I said pathophysiology is important to understand what are you going to do with the patient. So when they were, whenever there is increase in afterload and the heart is trying to pump, there will always be relative bradycardia, right? Yes. And if you give a beta blocker on top of it, that bradycardia response is likely to be enhanced. So it's dangerous to give only beta block it without giving a alpha blocker. That's why a combination is used here. That's why you're using magnesium sulfate. And the other drug which is used is? Magnesium sulfate, labetalol, and, and hydralazine. Hydralazine. Hydralazine also is a pure alpha blocker. No, direct, it's a direct Directly, arterial vasodilator. Yeah, direct vasodilator, isn't it? Yes. So these are the three drugs which you have to keep it in mind. There was another drug which used to be used, alpha-methyl dopa. Uh, nowadays, the patients are not on them. But do you know how does it act? And what was the relevance why we used to give alpha-methyl dopa? Central alpha agonist action. Central alpha agonist action. Alpha and central action. Central alpha agonistic. Anything? Central alpha to agonist. Central sympatholytic. How does it do that? Uh, it inhibits the presynaptic uh, uh, alpha-2 receptors are uh, like, um, acting on alpha-2 receptors, it will uh, decrease it's, the release of the catechol. It's just like dexmet. It, just remember that. Okay. So it decreases the adrenergic outflow from the central nervous system. It is metabolized to methyl norepinephrine. Okay. That is the one which acts basically on alpha-2. It's alpha-2 agonist. So producing those, that peripheral vasodilatation which you require. Okay which your Dexmed and drug Granity. is producing. Mm -hmm. What are the problems? Why is it taken off the uh, prescription now? What were the issues with alpha-methyl dopa? Can produce depression, mm -hmm. somnolence, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So these kind of things were there, which, which uh, that's the reason they have switched over to and the newer drugs are now, av now available. Okay. Uh, what is help or what are the complications of uh, preeclampsia? Many of them we have already talked about, but specifically let's talk about help. Help includes hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelet count. Mm. 
So how does it occur? Why does it occur? All these things have been integrated into a syndrome. Head syndrome is a severe form of preeclampsia. Uh, characterized, uh, the exact cause is not known. So you have, what did you say? Low platelet count. Hemolysis, evidence hemolysis. of hemolysis, uh, and elevate, elevate liver enzymes, and low platelet count. It, evidence of hemolysis include in the peripheral smear. So why does hemolysis occur? Uh, because of the vasoconstricted state, uh, there is increased fragmentation of... Anything else, vasoconstriction apart from that? Anything happens to, happening to the vessels? Endothelial injury, endothelial dis. Preeclampsia is characterized by widespread endothelial dysfunction. Uh, okay, so uh, now let's come to the management part. So if you have ruled out all these things and you have got the patient investigated, and if the patient comes for, let's say, in a severe form of preeclampsia, BP is 180 by 110, and they want to do a, they want to do an emergency section. What would you do? How would you manage this patient? What extra investigations would you order and how would you go ahead and manage? Investigation that will be sent, the uh, one is hemoglobin to look for a baseline hemoglobin level, total count to look for infections, differential count, then platelet count to look for thrombocytopenia, liver enzymes to look for impaired liver function, renal function, so all this will is going to take time, right? You're not Minim going to get everything immediately. Minimal investigation that required a platelet count, liver enzymes, and uh, creatine values. If platelet uh, count speak, speak into the mic, please. Don't use that hand. Use this hand. Close it, make it closer to your mouth. Uh, minimal investigations that required are one is platelet count. Agreed. To look for thrombocytopenia. Count. Okay. Then liver enzymes to look for any impaired liver function mm -hmm. and serum creatine. And if there is a uh, thrombocytopenia, then only we require a PT. So if this, is, if this is a patient who has come to you in emergency, that means, let us say, it is nice category almost going on to one. Would you still wait for all these investigations to come? You just have few minutes to induce and get the baby out. So what would you do? How would you manage? The BP is 180, 183 by 110. Uh, what would be your way of managing the, managing this patient? Any test related to coagulation? Any test related to coagulation? No. If only platelet count is reduced, uh, prothrombin time PTINR is required. Otherwise, if platelet no uh, count is normal, we can give an uraxial block with a... So, Monisha, you will not get a platelet count within 20 minutes, correct? Mm -hmm. So, what would you do? In this condition, what will you do? General, uh, general anesthesia. We'll anesthesia. go for general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Would you look at the platelet count, how early it was done before? What is the latest platelet count which was done? Was it one hour before, two hours before? We can look at a platelet count which was there, a trend of platelet count which has been happening. Maybe it was done one day before, then the other count is six hours before she went into nice one category. We can look at the trend at least, right? Okay. And even if you have to do maybe a bedside test, point of care, coagulation tests, if the BTCT. facility is available, BTCT. you can go for not BTCT. It doesn't make any sense to do BTCT there. At least one thing which you can do is if you have a facility of doing a TEG or Rotom, it is perfectly fine. You can do a bedside, but that also takes time. If you have to set a TEG up, TEG machine, which is not already set up, it will take an, another half an hour before you get the uh, get the report. So best thing would be you just take out the blood, keep it in a while, right? And just see how fast it coagulates. That's one thing which you should keep in mind. And order blood, cross-match blood, and make sure you, have, you are ready with transfusions, okay? Second thing is if there is increased bleeding, which is occurring because of decreased platelets, you must order for these components which you might require at that time. How would you decrease the BP? What were you going to do with the blood pressure? Are you going to take up the patient with this blood pressure or there are certain targets which you would like to make? 
optimize uh, if possible uh, if not for a fetal distress we'll uh, optimize the bp and uh, take up the case how much what will be your target where you want to get the bp to the blood pressure should not be decreased uh, uh, 20 percentage below from the recorded value so if it is 183 what would be your target of your systolic blood pressure how much should it come down before you 160 should aim at 160 maybe 150 160 at least to that level it comes down below 160 you may be happy right normally they say 140 uh -huh. but even if it is 150 i would be happy with that uh -huh. so what measures would you adopt to decrease the blood pressure how much time we have 10 minutes more right. so how much time how what are the methods to decrease the pressure now uh, in case of severe preeclampsia, we should initially start the patient on IV magnesium sulfate uh, uh, in order to prevent uh, the seizure. Now on table, would you start on magnesium sulfate? I uh, know, sir. We will manage. Uh, 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 we will manage the high BP. How? The, uh, form of uh, IV antihypertensives like administering IV lab labetalol. Yeah. The uh, first thing which you should opt for is IV labetalol, which is ready at hand. And as you said that you can give those 20 milligram boluses and see if the BP can be brought down. Would you like to give some opioids or certain things the patient is on the table you have to take up early? What would you do? Any other things which you have in mind? Because the main thing is to see that you don't have an intubation response. And until you have a platelet count, it's not worth taking a risk of going for a regional. Although regional is perfectly fine for patients if they have a platelet count above 70,000, right? But we do not know the status here and that risk cannot be taken. So how would you make sure that your BP or the hemo or your response to laryngoscopy and intubation is avoided? One is uh, IV, lab uh, IV labetalol response. That you IV given to get then, the BP down. What else okay, would you opioids do? Opioids in the form of fentanyl uh, at low doses can be given. So if you give opioid, what is the fetal maternal ratios of fentanyl? How much of is it going to cross the placenta and affect the baby? You know what is fetal, a fetal maternal okay, okay. ratio? Fetal maternal ratio is the quantitative assessment to know the uh, amount of drug that has passed to the fetus. Uh, it's about 0. 0. 0.6 in case 0. of fentanyl. 6. Right. So it's likely to cross over, isn't it? Yes. Sir. So what would you do? We will, uh, we will, uh, prior prior uh, before taking the patient uh, in, inside the ot we will make ready we will communicate with the pediatrician to be ready for the neonatal to make sure they have something to antagonize if you have to nice. give a higher dose of fentanyl to the patient so that that part should be taken care of how would you induce induce with propofol sir propofol yeah. why propofol Propofol reduces the system, uh, systemic vascular resistance. Uh, Why not thiopentol? Uh, either propofol or a thiopentol we can use, sir. In our institute, mostly. See, the is problem is always remember that the moment you give propofol, it is just washed away. And the time when you can start your, in, your IV, uh, your inhalational agent, it takes time. So in the central compartment, there is hardly any anesthetic while you are having your, uh, your inhalational agents which are on. Thiopentone can give you time. It will be there in, in circulation. It will not be immediately taken off the central pool. So let it be there so that it remains at that point before you, before you have, I mean, and the baby is delivered properly. So that is one thing. And make sure all precautions are taken that you give a lateral tilt, a wedge is kept because the uteroplacental perfusion is compromised. To an extent, you will have to give a head up position. Make sure you have the apneic oxygenation going on because the airway may be difficult. So don't miss out these crucial factors which I'm trying to tell you. Have a suction, white pore suction working. Know what is the last meal period of the, may, of the mother. Even if it is an emergency, these criteria should be first which should come into your mind that how are you going to prepare, what are you going to do. We will not jump over to propofol and even if I say how would you induce, these things have to come from your side that I am planning this kind of an induction, a rapid sequence induction. 
I'll have the patient with 35, 30 degrees head up. I'll make sure that there is something given, some lateral tilt and a wedge kept there, right? So there's no aortocable compression. Already there's uteroplacental insufficiency in such a high blood pressure, isn't it? So these things have to be taken into account. Have apneic oxygen continues. Have another source of oxygen because as you said, there will be upper airway edema. It is likely to be friable. And you may land up with problems. You must have video laryngoscope available there so that at least a second device is ready if you want. Okay? Please keep these things in mind. And always try to use in pregnant patients, thiopentone. It gives you time before the inhalational agents can take an effect because you can't give more than 1 mac or 1.2 mac before the delivery of the child. Because that will relax the uterus again. So it's a double-edged sword. So at this point of times, these agents are extremely useful. Okay. Hmm? Anything you want to add? Madam? How will you contact GA in this patient? As sir said, how will you contact GA? What are important points you cover? So apart from Lebetalol, apart from giving uh, uh, fentanyl and informing the neonatologist, are there any other options that can help you to obtain the hemodynamic response to laryngoscopy and intubation? In preeclampsia and pregnancy, and anything else you can use? 2% lignocaine. 2 person lignocaine. Good. If you, would, if you were to use uh, xylocard or preservative-free 2% lignocaine with uteroplacental insufficiency, so what is iron trapping? What is iron trapping? Hmm? How does iron trapping produce fetal acidosis? So lignocaine would be trapped inside the fetus and it's an acidic compound so there's going to be worsening of fetal acidosis if you give it in an IV form in that manner. Because you will have to give at least 1 to 1.5 that is about 150 milligrams of lignocaine. Right? And that is a good amount of lignocaine which can actually compromise the fetal status as well. Any other options? Any other options? IV MTC. Hmm? MTC. Speak in the mic. MTG. I couldn't hear you. NTG. NTG again, as I told you, is not a very good agent. But uh, if your blood pressure is not coming down, despite giving labetalol at times, then maybe a small dose for a very short time can be helpful. But the other agent which you can also use now I is Maxim mm -hmm. or mag magnesium sulfate as a 40 mi milligrams per kg bolus because that causes a good amount of vasodilatation and the patient may already had received or may not have received whatever it is. If, it is not, if the patient has not received earlier, it's a very good choice at this particular time just to give 40 milligrams per kg IV during the time of rapid C, I mean, before you plan out for a rapid sequence. And if you're planning fentanyl, make sure you have at least three minutes before you give fentanyl for a peak action to happen before you start administering your thiopentone. So that peak action is what you look for. Don't give everything together, right? What about... Uh, management of uterine tone, what drug would you give? Oxytocin. Oxytocin. What is the dose? Oxytocin. In our institution, uh, we administer 20 units uh, oxytocin in fine level NS over four hours and five units IV bolus. Five units IV bolus. In how many minutes? Uh, Three minutes. In three minutes. Okay, since we are just about one minute to go, there are two doses which have been defined. One is for an elective section, the other is for an emergency section. 
So when you're giving for an elective section, the dose which is recommended is about 2.5 international units, right? That can be given over a minute. And then you set up an infusion of about five international units per hour. You can go up to 7.5 international units per hour. That will be the maintenance after you have given about two international units of IV oxytocin over a minute. But if it is an emergency section where there is desensitization of oxytocin receptors taking place, then you will have to have higher doses of oxytocin which has to be delivered. And that dose is somewhere about three international units which you give straight away over 30 seconds. And then you have to set up an infusion of 7.5, right, to almost 15 international units per hour. So you go up to that dose, okay? So normal dose is about 2.5 international units and about, about 5 to 7.5 IU units per hour. So don't say in four hours because where you're going to give, how much you're going to give is in extremely important, right? Okay, sir. Any questions you want to ask us? If you have any doubts within 30 seconds. Okay. Thank you very much. It was really you, uh, nice to interact with you. Uh, very well prepared. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir.